morning, everybody. Uh, we'll go on now with the second talk of this session by Sarah Mason, who will tell us about the processing of verbal morphology in Spanish. Hello, I'm very excited to be here amongst faculty, friends, and colleagues. Um, because last year I missed this conference. I was in the basement of the Foreign Languages Building all three days collecting data for this project. So it's very exciting to be presenting some of that data to you now. Um, so like many people here, I'm interested in what do second language native and heritage speakers know about the morphology of their language and how do they access and use that knowledge, particularly in regards to regular and irregular morphology. So the basic question is, are those two kinds of morphology represented in processed in the same ways, or are they represented and processed in different ways? So let's go over some of the theoretical proposals that have been made for how that might happen in a first language, starting out with single mechanism models, which propose that all forms, singular or regular or irregular, are stored in a singular pattern associator network. Um, so the distinction between the grammar and the lexicon might be descriptively useful, but it's not a psychologically valid uh, distinction. Dual mechanism models propose just the opposite. There is such a distinction psychologically. Um, one such model is uh, Stephen Pinker's words and rules theory, which posits that words are going to be stored in the lexicon, and that includes most irregular words. Regular words, however, can be stored or they can be computed by way of morphological rules. So there's the grammar. Hybrid models, um, such as Kirigor's rules and probability models, are geared towards languages that, like Russian that have a um, less binary distinction between regular and irregular morphology. They would postulate, for instance, that rules are themselves applied probabilistically, depending on the frequency of use in the input and the uh, complexity of the allomorphy in question. And then there's also generative models, which really minimize storage to the greatest extent possible, positing default regular rules with wide applicability and subregular rules that are, are less light, widely used. And so only suppletives, such as go to went, um, where there's no possible role that could generate them, would be stored. What about second language speakers? Um, you could say, for instance, that they represent and process morphology in the same way as, as native speakers, in which case you could adopt any of the models previously presented or others that I left out. You could postulate that representation and processing of morphology is completely different from the L1, either because the universal grammar is unavailable or because L1 and L2 acquisition occur by way of different learning mechanisms. Or you could posit a partial overlap, such as, for instance, the declarative procedural hypothesis, which posits that words and rules is a valid idea for native speakers. Words reside in the declarative memory, are explicitly learned, rules in the procedural memory. But the procedural memory is subject to maturational constraints so that L2 speakers must rely on storage, on words, for learning all verbal forms, at least in the early parts of acquisition. Then there's also the shallow structure hypothesis, which um, postulates that L2 speakers are overly reliant on lexical and pragmatic cues for um, constructing representations of the speech they process. So this would also posit over-reliance on explicitly memorized, um, explicitly memorized morphological forms. Native speakers and L2 speakers are fairly well studies, studied. Heritage speakers are not, um, especially for heritage speakers of Spanish, which are an enormous group of people in this country. We know an appallingly little amount of information about their morphological processing. So what do we know that could inform us as to thinking about how they might perform my experiment? We do know that morphosyntactic knowledge appears to be a vulnerable and variable area in heritage speaker competence. We also know that morphosyntactic phenomena that are acquired more early are generally less vulnerable, such as for when um, Montreal 2009 found that the imperfect and the preterite, two tenses that I use in my experiments, were more likely to be maintained more strongly than the subjunctive, which is required later. So that's one. Um, tentative finding that could possibly inform how they might perform in this experiment. So let's talk about more about morphological regularity and irregularity in Spanish. This is kind of the classic example that you often see in the literature to show you a regular verb versus an irregular verb. In Spanish, it doesn't work quite the same as in Germanic languages. One, um, one aspect is that there are conjugational classes, which are differentiated by three thematic vowels in the base form. This can be seen as morphology on its own. It relates to no other aspect of the grammar or meaning of the verb. It's a purely morphological phenomenon and one that English does not have. Irregularities occur by way of changes to the stem, 
which can change quite significantly in some cases, but the um, inflection endings on the end are pretty much always the same. This means that irregular verbs, even the most irregular ones, are easily composable, which is or decomposable, which is not the same as, for instance, bring and brought. Um, specifically, I look at Spanish stem changing verbs, which means that in the vowel, right before the infinitive ending, there's either diphthongization or vowel raising. Another interesting thing that the same verb can have both stem changes and even others, depending on the tense. So sentir becomes siente in the present tense and sintió in the preterite tense. Um, why might these stem changes be a good can make these verbs good candidates for listing or storage? They're unproductive. Speakers have been shown to not want to generate them to nonce forms, and they're unpredictable. So it seems that they might not represent productive morphological process. They might need to be memorized or listed in the lexicon. Um, as proposed by Bowden et al., the study that I partially replicate and extend, these different aspects of morphological irregularity in Spanish actually overlap. The three different classes have different incidences of irregularity. AR verbs are most regular, followed by ER verbs, followed by IR verbs. Same thing with the imperfect tense being most regular, followed by the present tense, followed by the preterite tense. So it's possible that all of these factors might actually influence one's, in, one's tendency towards composition or storage. Um, so Baladin, as well as myself, designed a frequency effect study to try to find out if verbs are being stored or not. What that means is, if something is stored and not computed, we should expect one's reaction time in production or comprehension of the form to decrease with the form's frequency, basically. What did Bowden and all find? They found frequency effects on almost everything. For native speakers, in the present tense, only regular default class AR verbs showed no frequency effects. Everything else did, which seems to indicate that regular default class verbs are computed. Other ones are stored. Sounds like the words and rules model, for instance. L2 speakers showed frequency, of verbs, frequency effects for everything in both tenses, which seems to according to them, indicate a deficit in the procedural memory. Other studies have been a little more varied. A lot of them have found frequency effects on irregular words in native speakers of Germanic languages and on some regular words in different languages. I think some Germanic, I think there's also Finnish in there. Um, this, Latonin and Lane did a study on Swedish native speakers learning Finnish. They actually found no frequency effects at any range of frequency for L2 speakers. They say because the L2 speakers didn't have sufficient exposure to the language to develop storage of any particular forms, an idea that we will return to in the discussion. So what are my research questions? Well, reaction times for the production of the Spanish present tense and predict tense, I have results from that now, show frequency effects depending on regularity and conjugational class. And how will the frequency effects differ between native speakers, L2 speakers, and heritage speakers? Who are my participants? Now you're probably thinking, this study is great. What could possibly be wrong with it? One thing is that I only have four native speakers so far. Three are from Spain, one from Honduras, average age about 28 years old. They are all students at a certain large Midwestern university. L2 speakers, I have 34, I have a fairly large number. Native speakers of English, most monolingually raised. There's one heritage speaker of Chinese and one heritage speaker of Polish. I've got to consider whether or not they'll be included in the final results. Um, a bit younger, on average, I have a, so the proficiency test that we tend to use in the department is, uh, has a maximum score of 50. So scores range from 15 to 49. Pretty wide range, but most of them are clustered around very low to intermediate low. For heritage speakers, 20, all students at a large Midwestern or a different large Southwestern university, all exposed to both Spanish and English in early childhood, most of them exposed to Spanish first, um, a little bit older than the L2 speakers, a little bit younger than the native speakers. Um, I have a similar range of proficiency levels on the same test. Most of them are much higher proficiency, so these two groups aren't currently matched for proficiency yet. So there's one task for each tense. They saw written instructions in English, five practice items with sentence context. How did that work? For instance, they would read, a Juan le gusta mucho hablar, todos los días Juan siempre, and they would have to complete the sentence saying habla, conjugating the infinitive that's all caps. After that, they did five practice items with no sentence context, seeing just the infinitive and being asked to produce the conjugated form. And then they did a f 150 experimental items that were just like those last five practice items. What are the 150 items? 150 Spanish infinitives, 75 regular in the present tense, and 75 stem change in the present tense. The same verbs were used in the preterite, but that means only 25 of them are irregular in the preterite. The IR verbs also stem change, sometimes a different stem change in the preterite. 
Verbs are matched for lemma frequency and flective form frequency of all three tenses and the infinitive and length and phonemes, all things that can influence reaction times apart from what I want to be looking at. They were analyzed um, according to the protocol outlined in Bowden and all, so the data were transcribed and analyzed for correctness, only correct answers included. Following Bowden and all, trials were discarded if incorrect, if reaction time was under 500 milliseconds, but that's a good candidate for a microphone malfunction, or if it was 2.5 standard deviations above the participant's average reaction time, and our reaction times were LN transformed. Following Bowden et al., I constructed linear mixed effects models to see how the dependent variable, the natural log of the reaction time, was influenced by the following independent variables. Proficiency score, verb class, and verb regularity. And the models were run once to find main defects and once to find interactions between them. If you want to know more about the model, please see me. I'll be happy to send you a PDF with the actual codes and the p-values associated with the significant results that I'm about to expect, uh, present. There's a lot of them, and I don't want to be here talking till the conference ends today. You guys don't want that either. So what were the results of the models? So I've got the present tense on top and the preterite tense on the bottom in a different color. If it has a check, it appeared as a significant effect in at least one model. So these are all main effects. We can see that. Um, not nearly as much for my four native speakers, but all of these things appear to significantly influence reaction time for the L2 speakers and the heritage speakers in at least one of the two tenses. Here are some interactions. There's a lot of them. There's even some three-way interactions, which make your head hurt, but here they are. Um, a lot of interesting reactions for the native speakers, especially in the present tense. Not quite as much going on for the other groups. Um, now let's talk about correlations, the frequency effects, which should ideally tell us something similar to the models, but is not actually the same math. It's just correlations. So once again, we're looking for a negative correlation between reaction time and frequency. So this is for all verbs, looking at all three classes at once. Um, so a, a red number is actually a positive correlation, not predicted by any model so far. Black numbers are negative, but pretty close to zero. Green numbers are a somewhat significant, I didn't have any hugely significant negative correlations. So the only one we see when we look at all three classes is the for irregular verbs, for just heritage speakers. Looking at AR verbs, um, not too much changes, nothing in green. ER verbs, we start to see some green in L2 speakers. And then for IR verbs, at long last, we've got some not huge, but close to significant negative correlations. This is by far the biggest one right there. So to summarize and discuss these data, the models confirm that inflected form frequency is important on its own, and it shows up in some significant interactions in all three participant groups. The models also confirm that verb class and regularity are important both independently and in directions for the non-native speaker groups, which is interesting. However, significant frequency effects don't show up across the board in any of the groups. They seem to show up most often for all three groups for IR verbs. So the non-default verb class with the highest incidence of irregularity and also verbs that have two different stem changes in two different tenses. Um, most of the time, the coefficient is very close to zero, so we really can't say that there are frequency effects. Um, how does this relate to previous studies? In Bowden et al., native speakers showed frequency effects in the present tense for everything but regular AR verbs. So we can, we can confirm for the IR verbs, but nothing else. Um, the one study I found for heritage speakers, which would be Gore and Cook 2011, they concluded that heritage speakers were mostly accessing stored representation, so I can confirm that in some cases, but not all of them. Same for the L2 speakers. Some cases, apparent cases of storage, but it certainly doesn't seem to be happening across the board. So what can I really conclude? I want to tentatively support a dual mechanism model for all participant groups. What's my thinking about this? Because frequency effects were not always present, were not very strong, a, B, as pointed out by Preston, Sagara, McQuinney, and Kowalski, 2013. If speakers are sensitive, for instance, to verb class and factors other than token frequency, that really makes us call into question that they're just storing every item that they encounter. Um, they shouldn't be sensitive to the other factors if that's the case. It's 
uncontroversial that speakers explicitly, that L2 speakers explicitly memorize routines of regular and irregular transformations. There are already theoretical proposals about how that knowledge first memorized explicitly might become automatized or proceduralized with time and practice. Um, also, I want to bring up the point that my low proficiency speakers always said something. Cases in which they simply failed to respond were remarkably few. Um, and I very much doubt that they have stored representations of some of the very low frequency verbs that I included in my materials. Um, this doesn't rule out that there are differences between L1 and L2. Different methodologies could hopefully tell us if the tendency towards storage and composition might be different in one group opposed to the other, if um, the timeline might be different. I just don't think, as a second language speaker of Spanish, I'm the first to recognize that there are probably differences, but I just don't think that the existence of composition is one of those differences, at least based on these results. So what are the limitations of this study, the direction for future study? As I said, I have lots of lower frequency verbs. I'd like to consider, if I did a study like this again, or on this topic, I would have a wider range of verbs. My participants, I want more higher proficiency L2 learners. I want to probably triple the number of native speakers I have. I have several more that I haven't analyzed yet, but four is obviously not enough. And I'd like to at least match a subset of my second language and heritage speakers for proficiency so I could speak to what, a, what effect a certain level of proficiency had on both groups independently of their status as L2 or heritage speaker. These are production data. A lot of it had to be excluded because of that, either because of microphone problems or incorrectness. I'd like to do a comprehension methodology where our people could get more right answers and I could look at more of their responses. And I'd like to thank my RPI advisor, Dr. Rebecca Foote, and David Beery, the R Whisperer, for, his, for their tireless assistance in this project. Thank you very much. Just a very quick one on your statistics. Why did you run separate models for your interactions and main effects? If you, so when you run them for interactions, it also tests each one as main effects. Right. The main effects don't turn out the same way from one to the other. So I kind of wanted to see what would happen in both cases. As to which one is really best, I'm not sure. If anybody has ideas about that, please talk to me. Yes. Uh, may, perhaps Laurel is yet another R whisperer, so everyone should feel free to, to talk to her about this, and I'm sure whatever I answer will be trumped by her. But I would argue those are actually two very different things, right? If you find, if you run an, uh, you you run two different models, and so I, I actually got a little bit confused and was sort of conflating. I wouldn't want, you wouldn't want to present main effects from one model and interactions from an entirely separate model as if they were in the same model. They, they definitely weren't. I don't want to give that impression. Um, okay, the the two... The, the, I do. Um, what are your contrasts that you're using? Depending on the contrasts that you set up, come talk to me. We'll, we'll have a data party and we'll be great. Um, I would love to have a data party. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Depending on the contrast that you set up, there are differences in, interp in interpretation of the main effects. Okay. Um, so uh, One thing I can say is for the preterite tense, because only IR verbs are irregular, mm -hmm. if I want to see interactions between irregularity and class, I can't run it all as an interaction. because sure. so, so over there, I am going to need just different models. Yeah, yeah. But uh, everything else, if I could just do one. I think there are some ways you can put things into one model, um, it, depending on depending on exactly what comparisons you set up to test and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, uh, one, uh, so a couple other questions. Uh, what, um, so, so this, this idea of excluding past 2.5 standard deviations for reaction time data, um, how much did you, how much data did you end up excluding? That was a fairly small number. I, I can't give you the specifics, but I mean it was maximum five per person. Just a good check. To, to yeah. Do. Cool. Um, I had another question too, but I don't remember what it was. But um, this is a lot of really neat stuff, and if you want help with analysis, um, I do. Talk to me. <laughs> I, I'd love to help. So. Wonderful. Yep.
I'm interested in knowing more about uh, whether you looked at whether different linguistic factors also contributed to within each verb type of AR verbs, ER verbs, and IR verbs. Are you talking about some of the verbs like coser that are stem changing in one dialect and not the other? Not dialect differentiation, but for instance, uh, because you said that the frequency effect didn't play a big role apparently, and I wonder if you looked only the frequency effect within the verb, but if you c compare the three verbs, because the IR verbs are the least frequent ones, I wonder if that's oh. the frequency effect. They're all, everything's matched for lemma and, and inflected form frequency. Yeah. So that, that shouldn't be, that should have been controlled for, oh. assuming my frequency database is accurate. For l 2 is <laughs> it's probably not, but I don't know if there's a better one. Yeah, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could talk a little more about the theories and their predictions. So you mentioned that you know having frequency effects for everything would not be compatible with words and rules, you know, which would expect you get frequency effects for all irregulars, not for regulars. But you mentioned this, you know, uh, rules and probabilities model. What would that predict in terms of where the frequency effects should or shouldn't show up? Um, hybrid models like that. I'm going to try to find that that screen. So as far as I'm aware, it's not quite, it predicts not quite as strong of a contrast. It would predict, for instance, um, that so the ER and IR non-default verbs, they also have a regular rule that's different from the default regular rule. They might predict that those verbs are more likely to be stored because that regular rule isn't used as often in the input. Does that make sense? It's just a little bit of a more subtle prediction. That I'm not sure if we can. I'm not sure if we could really, if this mm -hmm. uh, methodology allows us to distinguish between these three. But does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, thank you very much.